What was the lady that brought last me the last week? Last week, last Monday. Thank you. I apologize for the tardiness. Um, we're about to start our subcommittee on conference here through the continuation of the Arbor money, which was a continuation from the Monday, March 7th meeting. Um, I ask the clerk if you would take attendance, please. Councilman Coopero. Absent. Councilman T. Garcia. Oh, <laughs> Present. <laughs> okay. Council Robinson. Absent. Council Taylor. Here. Council Lopez. Councilor Vega Maldonado. Here. Councilor Avogeneda. Councilor Brown. Here. Councilor Vido. Councilor De Jesus. Present. And Councilor Jay Garcia. She's on the way. Yeah, Judith Garcia is on yeah. the way, so we have so a quorum. Have quorum. So I'd like to start. Uh, again, um, I apologies. Um, our president is running late, and um, I was downstairs. Um, so, Mr. Manager, if you want to um, open up the presentation, and it's just a community. Um, continuation, but you can probably up speed as to where we left off and we'll follow from there. Sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Please so, know, I'm sorry, please know our <laughs> Council Garcia that joined us in here at this meeting. Thank you. So this is a continuation of the APA presentation to gain input from the City Council. As I've told you, the APA committee has been gathering input from lots of different sources over the course of the last uh, nine months now, including from the general public at a large public meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we started this going through this presentation. I think we got through the first, there are six categories under which there are uh, numerous potential strategies to be uh, funded. And we're now, we've started going through those categories. I think we got through two the last time. We're now on the third, which is affordable housing. There are a total of six, which Mo uh, will walk you through. Uh, we'll, we'll return to affordable housing because we didn't complete that. There's just one thing I want to emphasize that I'm not sure was clear uh, at the last meeting. In each of these uh, categories, you'll see nine or ten strategies, uh, potential priorities. And at the top are tentatively the ones that the committee has uh, have risen to the top in their discussions. This is not finalized at all yet. I just want to be clear that it is expected that in these categories, no more than two or three priorities will emerge as w for funding opportunities. So there might be eight or nine strategies you see, but at the end of the day, Two, at most, in each of these categories, two or three will be recommended for funding by APA because there simply is not enough money to fund all of these strategies. That is going to be the hard choices that will have to be made by the committee as to identify in each of these categories which of the two or three uh, strategies emerge as the ones that will receive some recommended funding. So I just wanted to point that out. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mo. He'll return to the third category we were working on or working through, which is uh, the housing category. So Mo. Thank me. you, Tom. Um, excuse me, Mo, before. Yep. City manager. That is, on these six <coughs> categories, is it the city's intention to or I, I guess I should say rephrase. Uh, how, what is your intention on the distribution of funds between these categories? Is it, is there gonna be an equal distribution among the categories? No. Okay, so, so It will be determined by the committee. So, so the committee will, will prioritize correct. the categories and Correct, so How the much money goes into which category? So the expectation is that there will be actually two more meetings of the committee. At tomorrow night's meeting, 
the goal is to have the committee finalize its two or three at most priorities within each of the six categories and then allocate the 15 million among those six buckets through a difficult voting process. They will, and so it's quite, it, you know, it could turn out that small business gets two million of the 15 and housing gets four million of the 15. That'll be entirely left to the determination of the committee vote tomorrow night. And, and, and of course the, commi the committee's vote is only a recommendation to the city. Correct. It is only a recommendation, but I have committed to try my best to follow the recommendations of this committee. And so the goal at tomorrow night's meeting is that the committee will get through that process, both finalizing its priorities, its two or three priorities in each category, and then allocating the 15 million in funding among those six categories. At, we think that will take the majority of that meeting tomorrow night. At the final meeting, the committee will then de allocate within each category the money available among the two or three priorities within that category. That'll be another difficult group of, dis of, uh, of determinations that the committee will have to make. That will be done at the last meeting. And by the conclusion of that meeting, we will have allocations of money for the top priorities in each category. That is the goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Garcia. Hi, thank you um, to my colleague here for those questions. So we're looking at 18 priorities total. Somewhere, I mean, if they chose two in each category, it would be 12, if they chose three in each category. So I would expect somewhere between 12 and 18 priorities will be selected by the committee. Thank you. And those would then be at the final determination of the city council's vote, correct? No, the city council does not have any vote in this. Their okay. vote, the council's input is here and with the votes of the two members that are members of the committee. Okay, so. They will vote on, they will, they will have the same vote to prioritize spending as everyone else on the committee. So if we have suggestions tonight, our suggestions will reflect tomorrow's meeting. They tomorrow will be, meeting. they will be brought to the attention of the committee that these are concerns, recommendations, requests of the council. Okay, thank you. Any other council member have a question? Okay, so, um, both. Um, if you don't mind, we'll try to let you get to the first two out of, we have four left of it tonight? Yeah, so we have uh, the, six of the, four. There are six total. We did two of them fully. We have housing to complete and then three others. So we're gonna get through all of them tonight. Right, so we have four. So Can I just make one final Please. point? This is important for the council to hear from me. I have, I have been clear, 15 million is gonna be allocated Correct. by this committee, and I'm setting aside the 25 million for capital project. But I haven't, in the capital improvement plan that I submitted to you, there's only about 18 million in projects thus far. I still want to spend the majority of that 25 million on capital projects. But if there were something that were of real significant concern of the council for which this money ought to be spent, there's opportunity within sort of my, this 25 million to do something that doesn't get approved by this committee, doesn't get forwarded, but the council feels they've missed some, you know, this is a huge need that we feel got missed there'll be opportunity to deal with something like that. So I don't want you to feel like you, you know, you've know you lost your last hope of something that's critically important to the council. My expectation is that most of the uh, decisions that we've made by this committee will be consistent with priorities of this council and the general public, but there is some opportunity there. I haven't spent all the 25 million yet. Thank you. And just again to remind folks that this is a unique opportunity that the city of Chelsea 
has provided to residents um, something that uh, is being held up as an example, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country for how residents should be involved. If anyone caught the article this weekend in the New York Times, it was a lot of uh, communities where they're really questioning how much resident input is being really brought to bear and is there just one person in the back making a decision? Are they political power plays and so forth? And so what Chelsea is doing here is phenomenal and, and really laudable and I just wanna extend that to you all as well because it, you could fight against it and that would really you know go with what a lot of other places are doing. So really wanna thank you all for supporting the city manager's decision in, making these $15 million available for the, uh, for the committee and for the participation of the city council members on that committee and in, in creating space to hear all of the things that folks have said. Um, that being said, just wanna remind folks that uh, we'll take your questions as best as we can, but remember if there are suggestions that you have for how things should be done, just give it to us as a suggestion. Like maybe you could do this or please think about these things we'll take those into account not only in the decision making, but more importantly, if that particular strategy gets moves forward, that becomes a suggestion to the city manager and the planning department about how to run the process. So we want those kinds of suggestions. So without further ado, I'm gonna go to housing. Um, what's listed there, did, did you wanna read these into the record again? I know that we did that last time. I don't think we need to read them again. No? Okay. No. So we'll start with housing, give folks a minute to re-familiarize yourself with them, and then we'll see if there are any questions. And the reason why I say that, I just want to say um, last time we just went through a lot of time and we all have this document and we've had it and we've actually, um, many of us, if not all of us, attended the community meetings and we have representation on the community. So um, right. as you stated, if we have any concerns or suggestions, even through your comments tonight or writings, make sure, because I believe as I'm listening, this is our last opportunity to get <laughs> it in, correct? It's a, it's a last opportunity to get your in, uh, input into the process before the committee meets tomorrow to refine the strategy. So okay, thank please, you. Uh, please give us your input. So anything on housing? Yes. Yeah. Victor, we'll, uh, we'll be dis uh, discussing. Okay. You want me to do it? In other words, the 10 titles, yeah, in, in the housing. Okay. Because of the viewers uh, looking on. Absolutely. So uh, increase equitable housing opportunities based on uh, resident needs, including affordable housing, public private partnerships, and workforce middle income um, with the AMI of 80 to 120 percent housing. Number two is increased new construction of affordable housing, mixed income housing, new sustainable models. Number three is make investments that leverage multiple additional resources to exempt, uh, to expand capacity for housing stability services, including support for resident rental arrearage. I know Roy would love that word, by the way. Um, four, temporary housing and emergency housing. Number five, support housing stability uh, initiatives and programs. Sorry, Brian. Such as Chelsea Evictions Task Force. Number six, um, increased redevelopment and rehabilitation of available housing stock to create healthy, comfortable homes. Uh, number seven, home ownership programs for current residents including rent to own opportunities, interest rate, subsidized and down payments assistance. Number eight, support rent increase mitigation, rent control, longer terms rental assistance initiative, incentives for landlords not, to not raise rents. Number nine, house vouchers to other support people already in apartments, housing and secure. Number 10, final, create housing specific, specifically for civil servants and community-based organization staff to live in the city. Questions? Yep. Councilor Maldonado. Um, 
Yes. For the first two priorities, um, a clarifying question. It doesn't really specify if this is like home ownership versus rental. If that's, it, is there like, is it specific to? And um, also if there's a way that this can be combined. The reason why, because if we're just prioritizing two to three, for me, I think four is extremely important. Temporary housing and emergency. Like we don't have any shelters here in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. That's a huge issue. Like, well, sorry. As someone that during the pandemic, alongside some of my fellows, heard the hardships and lived the realities of our community. Shelter is extremely important and housing stability is a need. Mm -hmm. And we have issues of, you know, people that are living overcrowded, um, fa families sharing two to three bedroom apartment, like multiple families sharing common areas so that, you know, they can make ends meet. And if, and that's also illegal. So if we're gonna go after that and we're not creating a solution, an immediate solution, then what are we, we're still displacing people. So for me, I like that's a quick, you know, like in my head, I'm like, okay, if there's, I wanna know if, if the first two, you know, are we creating home ownership opportunities? Mm -hmm. And then if there's a way that we can combine the two, one and two, so that it could be one, two, like four becomes three. Other suggestions, questions? No. So um, council is making a suggestion that um, you consider putting number, I mean, number four, the priority to her, but she's willing to combine that with number three, um, where it talks about the investment and leverage, um, but it also clearly states temporary housing and emergency housing. So that's something she wants to be related to the committee as a priority. As a priority, you, you want that to be highlighted? A top priority. I mean, so I just realized that they're not in specific order to prior, right? So these have been Could prioritized be. by the committee mm -hmm. in the order that you see here. Okay. Um, and so uh, they are looking at the input from the public meeting, your input, the input from the uh, survey to do their final prioritization. So. I'm hearing your advocacy for number four mm -hmm. and um, asking about the possibility of including a home ownership in one and two together. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, sir? Okay. So it is in order in it's, terms it's of priorities. It's in the order that the, uh, that the that community, the com the, uh, community advisory committee committed. did their initial prioritization. Okay. This is their order so far. And your input will influence okay. the reversal yes. to put it up higher. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's how it comes up. See, thank you. Gracias. Mm. And Councilor um, De Jesus. Sorry, can you start now? <laughs> oh, I thought you said finish. Um, <laughs> if you can explain number three, like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So in terms of the, uh, the third uh, strategy that's here, you'll see this recurring as a theme in some of the other categories. Yes. I think one of the goals of the committee, um, as well as the administration, is to use ARPA funding as a down payment or an investment that'll pay dividends down the road. So thinking through, you know, how can we use this small amount of money to bring in even larger amounts of housing funding, whether it's to produce home ownership opportunities, build a shelter, provide rental assistance, uh, the, whole, the whole nine yards. Um, but in terms of the third initiative, you know, housing stability was really central to that. So everything from case management services to rapid rehousing to, to wraparound services, but really with the focus on bringing in outside money. Okay, Councilor um, So I, I just, before I make my note, I also uh, agree with uh, Councilman Melinda Vega, the priorities as I see it through my conversations with the community 
go home ownership, rent stabiliza stabilization, um, emergency mm -hmm. housing opportunity for our families locally so that they're not displaced into shelters outside of Chelsea. Um, and then my, I have a, a few questions um, for number um, six. Uh, increase redevelopment and rehabilitation of available housing stock to create healthy, comfortable homes. Are we talking something similar to the project that is happening currently at Central Ave with the Housing Authority? This is, this is more like some of the rehabilitation programs that we have where we provide funding. This is one potential uh, program that could be run if this were a strategy that were chosen, which is more money for the rehabilitation programs that we have for residents who come in looking to upgrade rental units that they have so that they can deal with uh, uh, sanitary code violations and things of that nature. Okay. That's one potential program that could be done under this strategy, but Alex could also add. So in that vein, um, you know, the committee has emphasized, um, and you'll see this under the environmental health section, uh, lead abatement in housing, uh, mold abatement, addressing code compliance issues, as well as improving indoor air quality. So there's a nexus with the environment and housing, but again, that kind of permeates through the strategy as well. Okay, okay, and then um, somewhat similar to that question then, um, for number two, increase new construction of affordable housing mixed income. So it's my understanding that we're really low in like open spaces to build. So we would have to be using, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, buildings that are maybe condemned or, or buildings that are you know available to, to reconstruct, right? Um, is that what this is explaining to use available current housing or, stock to redevelop and, and make mixed income. Correct, so the goals of the committee with this strategy was to you know, foster the redevelopment of existing property into affordable housing as well as mixed income housing. The resident survey that we released you know, sought to prioritize affordable rental units. Uh, that was the response we heard by and large. Whether it's home ownership or rental, ultimately given the lack of vacant space in Chelsea, it'll have to be redevelopment, either increasing density or, or height, um, with some opportunities too to rehabilitate and adaptively reuse historic buildings. I think that's another important part. Okay, and in, in that process then, Alex, I'm sorry, I'm gonna bombard you with questions. No worries, what I'm here In for. that process then, what happens to the existing tenants who, um, you know, currently we have a project over at Central Lab, but private housing may not have a council um, that can represent tenants. What would happen to those private housing existing tenants while the building is being redeveloped? That's a good question. So any redevelopment or rehabilitation that is going to be city financed and city led, similar to the uh, Innis project, you know, we will be requiring that tenants are temporarily relocated to equivalent or better housing and they're offered a right of first refusal to move back to the new units. Okay. Um, uh, it depends on the, the, the project to tell you the truth. Um, in some projects, there are grant sources of funding that'll pay for it. In other projects, it would be the responsibility of the, the private investors. Okay. I just had two more questions and then. Okay. okay. It's okay, that's okay. Um, and then, uh, so for all the priorities that are listed, is there a local component to it um, where our Chelsea families get priority? To the maximum extent uh, practicable. So local preference for families with children, local preference for veterans, seniors. Um, the council can also choose to recommend other preferences that we could convey to the committee. Um, you know, for instance, we have a preference in many of our housing programs for families with children under six. Yep. Um, so those are just some of the options. Okay, could I add Thank domestic you. violence victims? If Absolutely. You can choose. And then also um, for the temporary and emergency housing, number four. Four. 
Um, on, can, it, can it be so that the program that is created under that priority also includes mental health services, um, workforce development services, so that it's not just a temporary home and that individual is on their own to look for? Is there ways to incorp incorporate funding that encompasses the, the entire wraparound services that that family needs? Absolutely. So we can certainly convey that to the committee. And in any of the emergency housing projects that we'll be embarking on, you know, we will include those supportive services. It's something that we've, you know, started to do during the pandemic and hope to continue to grow. That's it for now. Thank you. Any other counselor have any comments? Councilor Taylor. <clears throat> Taylor. So, um, yeah. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, and I was a part of prioritizing these, um, you know, uh, this category, um, I, I do want to just make one general comment on, um, I think, what the will of the council is kind of running throughout all of this, and that is that the emphasis on home ownership and increasing home ownership is is something that we we really want to see instead of instead of more and more rentals. The stability of housing and the stability of our residents, not just to provide housing for people that are coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and having kind of a you know negative kind of cycle. Um, that, that reverberates through the schools. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of uh, ramifications of this. But I think one of, the, one of the most important things for the future of Chelsea is to create a more stable population of people that are coming here and then staying here. And, and that means really trying to give opportunities for people that are already here renting to have a home ownership um, uh, opportunity and you know I've said it many times I'll say it again this is the American dream to have and, and being, a, be, being a city of immigrants we, we want to provide that to them you know we want to be able to have people not just paying their rent or being but being able to actually own their home and trying to trying to kind of put down some roots in a good community where, you know, let, let's face it, there's not too many communities like Chelsea, and 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 so we want to make sure that some of the people that make this place special can actually put down roots here. So so I think that, you know, and it solves a lot of problems I think that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> with with the constant turnover in people okay. so so if if we could just I mean I think that that the City Council has been pretty clear that this is a this is a priority um, Todd can I make a quick point one yeah. of the things that we saw in the survey was that it was a stark difference in the opinions on affordable housing as affordable rent versus affordable home ownership. And it really, home ownership jumped up when you got over 50K as household income. Mm -hmm. And so the you know 300 plus folks uh, out of 500 that responded to the survey um, were under 50K, which is also you know pretty much median income in Chelsea is under 50K. And for those folks, affordable rent was the concern. And so I just wanna make sure that that's clear, that's a, a part of the, conversation but what I hear from you is you want those folks to also be able to so, have home ownership so, and so, so home ownership so, that goes yeah, to so, that level so, so I think one of the that. reasons why you get that result is because well, people automatically think that oh well, that's not me you know and so you know part of I think I think an important component of public policy is to try to lift people yep. up and and you know have people be you know living a better existence than they were when they got here so you know i, I perfect be that as it, you know 
take it for what it's worth, I guess. So mm -hmm. that, that, was my, uh, that was my thing. The other, the other uh, priority um, is already on top that I, I have been trying to fight for, and that is the middle income people who basically have no programs and no money and are being forced out of the city, um, whereas you know, people on the lower end have a lot of programs already, um, in, including the inclusionary zoning, which is an ongoing affordable housing um, opportunities for, for lower income people at 30 and 50% AMI. Whereas we are constantly complaining that our workers, our firemen, our police officers don't live in the city and, and we complain about issuing waivers, but these people cannot really afford to live here as it is. So, you know, let's, let's, let's provide a little bit of love for those people. Thank, thank you. Thank you, um, Councilor. We also have those um, thoughts um, in here. And I guess what we're looking at is prioritizing. So we have a lot of that conversation, that discussion in here. It was not just left out. But at the end of the day, there's a prioritized list up here that we're trying to get actually some kind of feedback, solid feedback, and not really get into discussion where we are unless we're going to um, be here all night, but also suggest that we move, you know, what you're talking about, home ownership up to number one and move number one down to number six. So we're just really trying to get through here and see what it's there, and as the city manager stated, if some of these projects that we're really dear about, um, maybe the city council can invest in more after we see what has went forward. And we also have two, we have council members on the committee to address these also at tomorrow's meeting. Um, I think Council DeJesu has another comment. Briefly, um, when we talk about home ownership, I want to put an emphasis on our small homeowners. Um, and the homeowners that um, are currently struggling to continue to be homeowners in Chelsea and how we can support them, um, especially as we talk on number support rent increase mitigation. Um, if we can support and incentivize um, those homeowners um, who are currently maintaining the rent stable and affordable for their tenants in Chelsea, I think that would be a huge step forward for our families. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to make the dangerous move of saying that sounds like we can move forward. Yes. Wow. Yes. And if you want to complete your list again, you did it before. And if you I need help, I'll again. jump yes. in. And then we can actually get some um, feedback from the um, members of the council um, if there's any. Um, okay. Thank you. Food security. All right, so food security, number one, increase food pantry, support and develop a winter food distribution location mechanism. Number two, engage local and small businesses in food assistance and food distribution programs. Number three, establish community kitchens and teaching kitchens. Number four, food assistance programming, example, Chelsea Eats. Number five, provide education in healthy eating and how to shop in American grocery stores. Number six, establish urban agriculture infrastructure, such as farmers markets, community gardens, greenhouses, grants for residents to start gardens. Uh, number seven, provide access to food storage and education and kitchens for those who do not have access. Great, so those are the um, seven points. Um, from one to seven is prioritized. If you like to see something moved up, we wanna directly talk that and see if we can consider getting that moved up and highlight that. Anyone has any comments on the food security? <laughs> Councilor Garcia, do this. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would say, and, and here is echoing a keen balance um, between our small businesses here in Chelsea, our, our small bodegas and supermarkets, but also the needs of our families. I think number four is crucial, especially if we're developing a program very similar to what we already launched, which, which was Chelsea Eats. It's one, giving dignity to our families to have the autonomy to choose their foods and what they want to eat. But more than that, I think the other aspect where we have an opportunity to have double impact is 
allowing folks to use these Visa cards, these the, the cards that we create to shop at local supermarkets. I think of places like Compare. I think of places like your small bodegas that are located in Broadway. It's, it's crucial to continue to support our small businesses. And um, I understand the importance of having food pantries. I get it. But sometimes we're, we're taking away business from some of those smaller shops that need that, that economic support. So um, number four for me is, is priority. We've seen it work. We've seen the success. Why reinvent the wheel that's already there and it's been proven? Mm -hmm. Anyone else have Councilor Taylor? I, I agree in principle with what Councilor Garcia just said. I think the biggest concern on this whole section <coughs> is that I've heard multiple complaints from um, you know, business owners, store owners, who are, are missing out on, or they've lost business because right next door they're giving away free food to X, Y, and Z, and then they, you know, they, now they're suffering as well. I think one of the things that we did in the first, instead of the Chelsea Eats, which we don't really have the, we don't really have the money to, 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 to finance. I mean, we only did that as a, as a part of a, a huge, you know, benevolent grant that we got. Um, I don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel as the state already already has programs like this. I think it's it's much better to, if you want to do this on a, lo on a smaller city level, that we kind of do what we did in the first days of the pandemic, which was directing people that need this to certain restaurants or stores or whatever where they could, so, so that we get a kind of double bang for our buck. We provide something for somebody who needs something, and then we also provide the business to the local business person. So, you know, in order to kind of, you know, kind of give two things to two people instead of just one thing to one person, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, to do it. And that's my only comment. Um, I would say that I would say that for all of these priorities to keep in mind our community and um, how important it is to have culturally sensitive food options for our community um, I would say that I agree with um, my colleagues here in the council both number four is important and also number one um, I want to um, elaborate, number one, food pantries. They are important to make sure those who are homebound and are not able to um, go out into the community still receive the, the food for themselves or their families. Um, I think that that was a huge part of, um, you know, during the pandemic, what we um, were exercising in Chelsea was the, the opportunity to bring to those who were either COVID positive or simply elderly or with some type of handicap necessity, accessibility issue, mobility issue, bring the food to their doorsteps. And so that's extremely huge. And on top of that, people were still in need of the Chelsea Eats cards. And so I think a combination of those two are extremely important for the community. And then making sure that we have you know, culturally sensitive food options, our Latinos, our Somali Bantu community, um, the different cultures that we have in Chelsea should be represented in the, the food options. Yeah, and I know we don't have a vote tonight, but I get a sense that if we were voting tonight, we would keep one and we would put four as the second. Mm -hmm. So if you can put that, is that okay? I mean, we believe that, you know, food pantry, increasing the food pantry support uh, is, ex is just really uh, key to our community also having in the hands. Um, the reason why I say that with the engaged local business and small businesses into food distribution programs. We've tried that. I mean, we've tried a lot of those things. We've paid a lot of money, um, and we're still willing to try. But at the end of the day, uh, their customers say that we want these type of products. We want this type of food. Um, in our country, this is how we eat. We don't use this healthy oil. We don't use this until we can get there um, in maybe a year down the road, two years. 
we have to take care of the families right now and make sure we can survive this post pandemic and then offer these programs. So um, for whatever it is, um, we, we are um, really believe that folks still should have that um, opportunity for that assistant program with it and to increase that food given out to those that's in need. Thank you. And again, we have members that can address that tomorrow, all right, where we won't be voting tonight because we can't. <laughs> With that in mind, I'll move us forward to mental and behavioral health. There are 10 options here. I'll uh, briefly go over them. Number one, support for youth development programs, including extracurricular activities at no or low cost for students, opportunities for sports and recreation outside of school time, a community center or youth center, one-stop multi-service center, and music lessons. Number two, increased mental health services including those for zero to eight year olds. So in general for everybody, including zero to eight year olds. Number three, support rapid crisis intervention teams and increase social worker services in the city or within the city. Number four, expand services for those experiencing domestic violence. Number five, launch a campaign to address mental health stigma and normalize getting help in seeking out resources, including rapid referral card that's a card that has the rapid referral mm -hmm. information on the card. Um, number six, provide trauma and mental health supports for immigrants and uh, the undocumented. Mental. Number seven, mental, mental health, health and well-being training for parents and community. Number eight, increase number of locations available to residents to access mental health resources, multi-service center. Number nine, implement preventive mental health measures and early supports including peer-to-peer -peer mental health, and number 10, support peer-to-peer -peer support for addiction and substance abuse. Any questions? Just give okay. folks a minute, that's a lot of, uh, it is. lot of them to read through. And it's a lot of need also. Yeah. Um, Councilor Taylor. I would just say that I think <clears throat> this particular category is uh, one of the more important ones in my opinion because it is the, the one that is the most underutilized. Like we, we don't have a lot of, uh, and I, th I think that is not just Chelsea, that's, that's, you can go all the way up the food chain that we don't in this country uh, at any level put enough money in, into this uh, category. Um, uh, if, I, if I agree with the uh, first three I think that those those are ones. I mean, actually, all of these are are legitimate, mm -hmm. and I think this might be a category where you might take more than two or three, or at least there are some some of these, like the uh, launching a campaign to address mental health stigma and normalize getting help. I mean, Number that's five. not going to cost very much money. You could do that for, and and I think that that's something that that's 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 helpful that could also be done. So I think. And I think combining some of these things um, is a smarter way to go, but I basically think that the top three and maybe four, although we have um, some organizations that help with domestic violence, it is a big problem and we do need to address it uh, more effectively, but um, uh, you know, I, I think this is basically right. But I do think that this particular category should, should definitely receive its fair share of funding. Councilor DeJesus. Just very briefly, I would add that, um, especially for our youth in the community, we need, because we know we're dealing with all these housing needs, overcrowded apartments and parents working or looking for multiple jobs, we need to have places with these services available and open in the evenings and the afternoons. I think in my district there was a, a meeting where one of the one of our residents said, the schools open during the weekend and make that a safe place for, for youth to be able to engage in these um, mental health services. Um, but especially for the youth in the community so that we can try to mitigate or end this, this generational trauma. And I'm fine with them myself because uh, this year also demonstrated how important it was during the pandemic, which was not offered and coming out of the pandemic, we're actually going to see some of these things occur. Some of these services are gonna be needed so rapidly when people start to act out or just start to get out and get an aggressive. 
and being so isolated for so long and stuff, we're gonna have to have some monitor, we're gonna have to have some support system where we can actually identify um, whether they be eight months to you know 36 years old or older, we're definitely gonna have to be able to try to have resource available. So I'm in favor of this here and however it gets put together, it's a needed um, process and a needed um, service coming out of the post pandemic. Council Maldonado, Bates. Thank you. I, I echo what a lot of my peers say, um, especially with the fact that these services are underfunded. And if we have, we have a tremendous opportunity here that we can prioritize this, let's take the opportunity. And I think we should do some magic here. And I agree with Todd when he said some of these things, if we can combine it, let's do it. I, you know, like, for me, I agree that prioritizing youth is essential, but that when I read like nine and 10, preventing, you know, like implement pre preventive mental health measures and early support, like that shouldn't be nine. You know, like that for me is also one that's up here. This, all of these are kind of like one and twos for me. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Honestly. So mm -hmm. in being that this is something that already has has been underserved and is a, a, in dire need in our community. Um, so I, I really, really, really want to just say if we can really spend some time with this and, and try to do something so we can support our community better when it comes to mental health and addiction and substance abuse and all. This is very, very important and something that we need extensively. And this is like a root issue in so many other things as well that it shouldn't be overlooked. Like, you know, with domestic abuse, alcoholism, all these things, our young people like witnessing this and now, I mean, I, can we imagine what COVID, like, is happen like two years after COVID? Like, what's what is that going to look like? So I think if we have an opportunity, let's let's do it. Now, were you? I just had a, a thought. Um, were you? Were you like to speak? Okay. Um, so my thought is that you know, with the mental and behavioral health um, points here. Did we have any local hospitals or anyone that joined these meetings that was willing to partner with us to provide the service? Because obviously, we as a city, we're not doctors or clinicians, but we're looking for partnership here. Did we have any of that discussion? We had, sorry. Um, what we did have was representation from mental health providers in the focus groups on mental health and behavioral health and behavioral health providers, so we have their prioritization of it. I think what you're asking is, are they going to put their resources to bear as well? And or just collaboration? Or collaboration. Did, did we get any of that out of those meetings? I can tell you that there's a lot of energy behind that and, and desire. I don't think there's anything that's set. And we also weren't asking that question. We were asking what was important, what should we be paying attention to, what should be funded. But I think your advice I think, uh, and to the folks who are gonna be actually implementing this, is to seek out the collaboration of the hospitals and the mental health providers. So I wanna make sure we take that. Yeah, because I, you know, one of the things I was talking about, we have navigators here, we have um, North Suffolk Mental Health, and I'm, you know, we, we, we're getting emotionally here. We, we're getting caught up in these great ideas, but at the end of the day, when we fund them, Where's the collaboration? Who's the experts? Uh, is it gonna be the city council? Is it gonna be the committee? Uh, are we just gonna throw it in? I, I'm just not sure what's the joint effort here. And maybe, okay, yes, hold on. So that's an excellent question. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that the answer is going to be variable depending on the project or the, the program. But in essence, for anything like mental and behavioral health or housing, once we have the committee's recommendations, we'll have the allocation plan and their two or three priorities. 
it'll be the city's responsibility to distill those into projects and programs and forge partnerships or build off of our existing partnerships with local community-based organizations and healthcare institutes to deliver these, these services and, and these projects. So none of this is going to be done by the city alone. We're going to have to rely heavily on our partners and we're going to look to collaborate in deeper ways than we have to date with many of the organizations in Chelsea, like our nonprofits and our healthcare uh, organizations, particularly in this area. So when we talk about mental health and behavior, aren't we talking about professionals? We are, so okay. licensed social workers, yeah. you know, clinicians yeah. and the like, yeah. absolutely. And, and have there been any discussion about also this involving the schools? Uh, there has been. The uh, superintendent was gracious enough to attend one of the recent committee meetings. She provided a presentation on the school department's ARPA plan, including their plan for increasing resources for social workers, clinicians, and mental and behavioral health. This is one of the major issues of, of her administration, so we see a lot of synergy there and opportunities to collaborate. So potentially this has an opportunity to lead to some creation of hiring. Sorry, say that last part again. Hire, job hiring for um, someone to be on. I'm just wondering how do you run these valuable needed programs without specialists or folks to truly understand the, you know, the, the, the degree of what we're dealing with after coming out of um, this isolation for 27 months. Right, so I would envision that the entities and the organizations with whom we partner with will have to undertake hiring activity in order to boost their capacity to deliver these services. Um, we're also thinking through right now sort of what role does the city play in terms of strategic planning, facilitation, and coordinating services. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing dialogue as well. Just lastly, um, that the reason why I address those is because we, we're talking about funding them, but we still need to do all that what you just said prior to funding them. Now we're gonna you know, prioritize them, but we really don't have the game plan of the funding or the staffing. So that's just my thought. But, uh, one thing, there was discussion on the committee okay. about using the, the Chelsea Hub as kind of a, a model to, you know, instead of uh, um, focusing on, on addiction or, you know, other types of issues to, to kind of pull in mental health and have more interventions and trying to be proactive with, with, with things much like the Hub and pulling together in collaboration uh, a lot of these same people, so I'm assuming that it would be uh, just like that. So right. I, I don't think that those are big concerns as far as you know. We've done it with the hub. Let's let's try to do only, it with, with mental health. I appreciate your comments, Councillor. I only would consideration to that's there, but it's at the lower end of the prioritized list, where you see one and two. It does not, in the, especially one. You know, it does not include the Chelsea Hub, or you know, we used to talk, start talking about number seven and number um, two, and you know, number three. Those are very important items. Okay. What my colleague, uh, Councillor Melinda Vega, mentioned substance abuse. I don't know where that falls here. I don't see it on mental health, but I think both go hand in hand. And then two, um, with regards to coalitions and groups that are established to convene the different um, partners that work on these issues, I wanna be extremely cautious of the funding that is used for that time and making sure that the bulk of the funding is used for the work on the ground, the navigators that are out there day and night looking for these uh, community members struggling with mental health and substance abuse. Amen. I think that is the important part of this work, not so much the convening. It's a combination of both, but I wanna see the bulk of it go to the hands-on field work. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure 
Yes, finally, Palestine. right? <laughs> I want to make sure that when these groups get together, they, they are not tossing the ball over and, and just make sure that they're dealing with the specific issue without, um, at times, I, I experience um, situations that the situation doesn't get resolved just because they're tossing the ball back and forth. But we just want to be um, clear with, with whoever's dealing with the situation. Another thing is um, most, I'm seeing the survey numbers and most of the, um, the participants and the respondents are Latinos. All these services will be provided in Spanish to our families. And another thing is a lot of our family members are illiterate. Are we doing videos? What are we doing to take care of that community? So that's a great question. So in terms of promoting the visibility of programs that'll originate from this, it will be a lot of videos. And as the Councilor de Jesus was mentioning, a lot of extensive on the ground work. Um, none of this is going to be possible by simply creating a flyer to market services and kind of ending there. We're going to have to have boots on the ground and that will necessitate building capacity. I'll you know, be blunt with you, we don't have the capacity right now to do that at the scale that we have to do it at, whether it's the outreach navigators, social workers, um, what, what, what have you, either internally or, or externally. Um, so absolutely everything will be English and Spanish with other languages available, highly visual. And we do want to ensure that we're targeting funds to increase capacity for that type of intensive hands-on kind of case management and on the ground engagement. Real brief. My last point is um, on top of what uh, Councillor um, Garcia was just mentioning, um, to ensure that with the mental health services, we are being mindful of um, having uh, available both male and female workers so that when we encounter mental health, substance abuse, domestic violence, whatever the case is, we can be sensitive mm -hmm. to these cases as, as it comes up. Are any other comments? We will move to the last yeah, category. I mean, before we just move from here, I oh. just think I just think there's some interest in just shifting some of these prior prioritized numbers around. I mean, we have members um, representing us on the council, and we hope that they would address that. Um, you know, I, all of us, I believe, are really you know adequate adequate supporters of youth uh, employment, youth development. But we want to make sure that people minds and their st state of mind and their mentality is together. And, and a lot of these things below that helps address that. And, you know, um, so we want to make sure moving, again, this is money for post COVID. These actions, these impacts, these, you know, again, I can't say it enough, being, in, you know, locked in your, excuse me, your apartment or your home or out of work for 19 months and trying to get back on your feet, it, it did something to your mind, you know? I mean, people are still are saying, you know what, masks are all set, but we still want to wear them because for 17 months, 18 months we've been wearing them. We still want to make sure that we're okay. So we want to make sure that these families are getting the service and coming out and really knowing that there's service there and I think some of these just below the first one um, should be really highly prioritized. We don't have a priority like a, that is specific to young people, to youth. This, I almost feel like I'm sorry, but that priority is sort of kind of its own thing and it's, so, it's like put there because it's, there's nowhere else to go. You feel me? Like, I, I honestly don't think, like, I, I mean, I can see the intersectionality, right, in terms of the support necessary to be preventive and avoid these things from happening. But if we're focusing on those issues, 
then I, I, I think two and below are more. And I, and I think that's a, that's a big oopsie that we didn't, we don't have a category for our young people by themselves, but that's, I, I'm not okay with that. I just realized that, I'm sorry. Okay. And I don't, so I, yeah. if we can't, I don't even know how we can figure that out, but I, as someone that comes from youth organizing and, you know, have been empowered as long as I could remember, we, we need to fix that. Our young people should have a voice and it should be a top priority, unless if there's a page here that I'm not seeing. No, uh, I, I will mention that we did have groups with young people and okay. that they prioritized the, some of the things that you have so here. So they were part of the they focus They were part of the process, groups. yes. Yeah. They're part of focus groups. We went to youth groups. There were young people at the public meeting, young people who answered the survey. So we've got some voices in there. And I want to say um, that your uh, suggestion there is really powerful and that uh, it is something that, you know, maybe thinking about it, maybe we would have done something different to have a separate category, but they've mm -hmm. been integrated into this, including in workforce development and in housing and in these spaces as well, and mental I, health. And I think that, and I would say like, I, th I think that is extremely powerful because that gives them peer to peer, like, you know, in terms of ageism, mm -hmm. that kind of disqualifies that, right? Yeah. But I still think that they are a priority that we should look in, like we shouldn't overlook. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we did invite the Youth Commission to the, uh, the public meetings as well as the focus groups. Outside of that, we met with a focus group at Chelsea High School that's comprised of about 40 to 50 uh, young adults um, that participated in their own separate focus group. There were focus groups held with the Chelsea Housing Authority Tenants Council that included youth as well as, uh, you know, gamut of different community-based organization meetings. Um, so we were pleased generally with the youth engagement on this. It was some of the highest we've seen in projects. Obviously, we can certainly improve upon that, and not all voices were captured. So I appreciate you bringing this up. This is a, a good suggestion. Thank you. May we? Mm -hmm. We may. All right. We're on to the last of the last. Uh, environmental health has nine uh, strategies. I'll read through them quickly. Number one, increase the amount of open space, parks, and active outdoor spaces. Number two, support pest control and mold mitigation within housing stock. Number three, develop programming for homeowners and small landlords who may need to renovate to bring house up to code, housing up to code. Number four, support renovation of homes to improve windows ventilation and decrease noise pollution. Number five, support indoor and outdoor efforts to mitigate industrial and vehic vehicular exhaust. Number six, increasing street cleaning, sanitation in public spaces and pest control, including commercial and resident responsibility for cleanliness and education to the general public. Number seven, plant more trees. Number eight, increase education about environmental health and taking care of, environment, uh, of the environment protecting parks, protecting trees, rising water. Uh, number nine, develop a bike path to connect Chelsea to Boston. Any, ooh, okay, <laughs> Judith Garcia. Attorney <laughs> Garcia. Judith Garcia, okay, thank you. So um, I'll go with point number one. Uh, thank you for clarifying that you've spoken to, to youth. Um, I've also had the opportunity to, to hear from them and in terms of open space and parks, I've heard time and time again that the word is just thrown so loosely and it's become such a vanilla conversation. All we say it's open space and more parks and it's just, it's like the glamorous thing to do nowadays. Let's have parks and let's have open space, but it doesn't necessarily speak to the needs of, of the kids. And one of the key things I keep hearing is kids want a skate park. And they've said it many, many times. Skate park, skate park, skate park. So, um, so if we can figure out a way to like fit that into the open space and parks, um, that would be fabulous. That is a paramount priority right now. So we just, uh, as you know, had a 
eligibility round for the Community Preservation Act uh, funding. And we received a number of, of applications for projects, but a group of teens organized an application to devote funding for a skate park. And it's been something we've heard time and time again. We've been hard pressed to find land or to come up with the resources to acquire property. But this could present an opportunity to at least mm -hmm. acquire the land and construct the facility necessary. So it's something we've been when hearing in all of our conversations. Yeah, that'd be great. And I mean, they, they themselves have ideas of where the skate park can go. And I can tell you that I see them all the time. Like, I don't drive in Chelsea. I walk everywhere. And I see these kids right under the bridge, or right under the Tobin Bridge. They, they play there a bit behind the Williams garage. They go um, right behind on, like, by Cherry Street, right behind the CVS. They try to find and be creative of where they can skate. I've seen some amazing young ladies who like try to do it behind their home. So um, I know this is a priority and it would bring so much hope and joy to our kids to have a skate park. So ask them because they have, I cannot tell you, they've already identified three places where I think, oh my God, where do you guys get these ideas? But um, that would be a really lovely one. And gender neutral too, so love it. Will we be gifting bikes <laughs> because of the bike, the bike tax? Because I just, I find that, well, I am one out of five, and my oldest sister got a bike before me because my parents couldn't afford a bike. So I know that most of our youth will love to use this bike path, but without a bike, you can't use it. I mean, is there gonna be a program where we're gonna be raffling bikes out? Absolutely. So some, I guess, food and for the, the blue bikes. Yeah, yeah, the blue bikes. We already have one. But go ahead. Some of them Alex. are I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alex. I mean, they're all here. Thank you, Councilor. So just some food for thought, and this is tied into two initiatives, one that's underway and one that we have devised but we have not yet secured funding for. So um, as you were mentioning, the blue bike system blue bike. is operational in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more that we can do to make that more accessible to residents and make it more affordable to residents. Yeah. Uh, secondly, over the course of the last year, our North Suffolk Office of Resilience and Sustainability, the regional climate group that is housed in our department, developed an e-bike uh, pilot program, which would essentially consist of purchasing electric powered uh, bicycles and raffling them off to low moderate income families depending on their need. So not only would that allow for bicycling and healthy activity, but it would introduce a newer technology that makes cycling a little bit easier and could hopefully shift folks away from driving and all their, all their trips. Um, so this type of funding could be used for um, something of that nature. Thank you. Councilor De Jesus. Yeah, I just wanna briefly emphasize number three and two, um, as it connects to a lot of the concerns that have come up um, in the community. Um, I would say that, you know, also, I know that there is currently uh, an awesome project that the Affordable Housing Trust uh, is launching or will be launching regarding elderly and um, renovations for elderly and, and whatnot. Um, but those who are not elderly and are homeowners in our city, I see a lot of my neighbors, you know, they have windows that are deteriorating. I think there's um, also one here for win number four um, and, and stairs that are not um, up to code. Um, and so I, I think three and four can definitely be um, combined. Um, and number two, well, we, we all know what's going on with number two in, in the community, so. <laughs> Councilor Taylor. I really think that it, uh, you know, there's two kind of categories within this category, and that is the public, the public space and the private space. And, you know, one, the, the first one's kind of a general um, thing where the entire community can kind of benefit. The second one is addressing um, more kind of health concerns, I think, where, whereas, you know, you have, especially with number two, that we've, we've heard constant um, complaints from the public regarding rats and, and, and 
the need for more pest control, the need for um, especially uh, getting rid of mold and uh, you know other various kind of environmental hazards within a house that can really affect somebody's health. So um, I, I think concentrating on those two kind of things is probably the most practical um, uh, thing. I, I, I agree with my colleagues that some of these things can be combined again, and I think that you know, like you, you had you had said, uh, Alex, that uh, it's the it's the city's job to distill some of this stuff when when it comes to it. So I I would just recommend that that's you know you, you try to incorporate some of the things that can be um, combined here. So that's it. Thank you. And I was a vice president at Chelsea to Boston. I'm just wondering, like, how the safety part, because I remember being a young person having this conversation as an eco member. Um, and we, we did, like, the, well, I didn't even know how to ride a bike, but um, we, ex <laughs> see, I didn't have access to a bike. I don't know how to ride a bike, people. Um, but we experimented, other crew members that know how to ride a bike, um, going like the back way into Boston. And that's like, and that's how people do drive into Boston, right? And that's, that is not safe at all. I no, mean, not drive, use a, the bike to get into Boston because lane, that's, no. that's literally. It's an official bike lane. But yeah. it's not safe. So we're it's constructing safe. a we're, we're separated up, cycle yeah. track. So yeah. by the end of this calendar year, you'll yeah. start to see a separated shared use path along Beecham yeah. and William Street, protected by a curb and in many locations a guardrail. But that's only the first connection. Mm. Um, any spaces that we propose for a bicycle connection, whether it's from Chelsea to Eastie or continuing that uh, route, would have to be built according to best practice. Most of the time, if feasible, the best practice is to separate it with some type of guard, curbing, guardrail, barrier, what, what have you. In some places, that's not feasible because of a lack of space. Um, so there are some other methods that we use. This is a conversation we are also having, though, with the city of Boston right now, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the context of the, the two bridges as they look to upgrade um, the Meridian Street Bridge over the next five years. Thank you. OK, moving along. Look like we're getting there. Head no down. Uh, so um, prior to closing it out, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight um, in the absence of our president, um, who could not be here with us tonight, but also the members that made it tonight to ask these questions. But um, I hope um, not only that you will take our concerns and our thoughts back to the committee, but also the members of the council that we have to represent this body also address those. So if anyone has any closing remarks that you would like to make sure that was noted or should be noted, um, we can have our final remarks. If not, um, we can close the meeting down. Questions? Thank you for conducting this meeting and allowing us to participate. If anything were to come up in the next six hours, next 24 hours, can we write an email and then let you know so you can present it to the board? Um, and you said there's two more meetings for this committee. Tomorrow is expected to be the day where they finalize their priorities. What's the last meeting? So tomorrow they finalize their priorities and do an initial distribution of the dollars by the categories, so the six categories that you saw, mm -hmm. so how much would go into each category. The next meeting, it's our hope, obviously, with progress through the meeting, um, in the next meeting they would go into each of those categories and uh, make recommendations about how much of those allotted dollars would go to each strategy. So for example, if three strategies were allocated for housing, and housing tomorrow night got $4 million, the next meeting, it would be of those three categories, how would you allocate the $4 million between those three categories? Got it, is it, isn't tomorrow's meeting open to the public? All of these meetings are 
uh, meetings of the committee. They're fully available by video after the meeting. So I wouldn't be inviting people to come to the meeting. Obviously, you know, COVID has been one of those things that we've been very careful about. And as a public health person, I would continue that. Um, so, if so the meeting is not open to the public. To my it's knowledge, it is not open to the public. It is it's not. a meeting okay. of the committee. So okay. So if anyone. Observers? Yes. Even as observers, yeah. Okay. And so if we want, if anyone wants to submit comments, how do we reach this board? So we have had the last, you know, six months of receiving comments. Yeah. We've extended to everybody here our email to provide comments. All of you can provide your comments also to your members on the committee themselves. Okay. You can bring them forward. <laughs> and if you have comments yeah. from the general public that somehow have not been part of the public meeting, the survey, the community uh, meetings we did, the community-based organizations, yeah. focus groups, and the individual uh, interviews, please forward them to me. I gave you my email. I would love yeah. to have them. And the, the response of the surveys are back here. Yes, we gave Perfect. you the response there, and there's uh, some additional information on that that we can share. Great. Well. So I'll be emailing my colleague. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Manager, would you like to say anything, close out? Um, you have anything you'd like us to know about the final meeting tomorrow and what you will be presenting to or addressing the committee? You know, I, I mean, I, I laid out at the beginning how this process is supposed to play itself out. Uh, hopefully that after that last meeting of the committee, there'll be some clear recommendations to the city about how the public and this committee wishes money to be prioritized. Once we have that, we will then, it'll be obviously up to us as a, as a administration to figure out how best to implement those strategies that have money attached to them. As, as Alex said, some of that will be done by putting out requests for proposals to outside entities to do some of this work. Obviously, if a priority is uh, uh, supporting food pantries, the city's not intended to get back into the food distribution business, so we would be putting out RFPs to provide support to outside entities doing food pantries. But some of this will be uh, uh, work that the city either needs to take on or needs to carefully oversee. So for instance, in the behavioral health realm, uh, we need to build up some capacity internally to do some of this work. And mm -hmm. that probably starts with having a more robust health and human services department. Uh, right now, we don't even have a health and human services director. But you're going to see that as a proposal in the budget to at least start to rebuild that department mm -hmm. with the creation, with the funding of a director's position. And it's possible that with some of this APA funding, depending on what the priorities are, we may build up that department with APA support. Uh, same in the small business. So some of the uh, recommendations in there will likely demand that the city put out RFPs for outside help to small businesses, but some may just entail building additional capacity within Alex's department for a small business specialist, for example. So there'll be a mix of uh, capacity building within City Hall and our in partnerships with outside entities. Uh, that's really going to be the work of the city once we have this prioritized list from the committee uh, of where they would like the city to spend this half a dollar. So the city has a lot of work to do once we get this prioritized uh, list of recommendations from this committee. That's almost the beginning of the work, not the end of the work. Thank you, um, City Manager. How soon do you expect some of these projects, like the urgent ones, housing, mental health, to be already out in the community and ready for our residents? So 
as quick as we can, but I will, I, I do want to make clear one thing, which I've had conversations with some counselors, but not everyone on this. We have spent APA money already continuing some of the critical services that we were doing with Federal CARES Act dollars. So there, there, there ha we have, so some of the critical services that we were doing during COVID, support of food pantries, su uh, eviction uh, task force services, uh, uh, those kind of things, we, when Federal CARES Act funded ran out for those critical services, we continue them post, uh, dis, post fall of 2021 with APA dollars. So we have already s have been spending some APA dollars to continue the critical, uh, the, the, the sort of highest of priority needs that we have seen in the community. We've continued them with APA spending. So. I hope that put you a little at ease that we haven't, that there hasn't been this gap between what we were doing to protect people during COVID and now we're sitting here and nothing's happening and we're waiting to spend up a dollars. There has been a continuation of some sort of emergency type spending that we've done to keep programs in place that were operating effectively during COVID. Some of these other things will take a little time and, but my hope is that certainly as we get into the summer, we will start pro working on the programming that we need and getting out RFPs and building some in-house capacity as well. Thank you. Todd, Councilor Taylor. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I just wanted to say um, to my colleagues too that um, just email me anything you want me to voice before the committee tomorrow and I will do so. The other thing was um, that some of these important um, things that don't end up getting funded, um, I think you made a good point, uh, Councillor uh, Maldonado, that uh, you know the youth portion kind of almost deserved its own category and, and I would be willing to work with uh, uh, with uh, any of my colleagues to try to address some of these things outside the realm of ARPA. So please feel free to reach out. I'd be willing to do that. But I want to thank everyone for coming in. Um, thank you for your time, co uh, council members, Paul, Alex, thank you, Carl, and young lady. Um, thank you all for being here, um, participating, and helping us get more knowledge and understanding this process and uh, no more business with this council regarding this matter. Thank you.